with you. Good to see you all. Uh, before we get started, let's give a round of applause for the soup and salad. For our the only thing you make them come out, are they, are they refusing? Yeah, plenty of soup and salad available, so please uh, pick some up, take home if you need to. Also, just pointing out that we hope to have soup and salad for every one of these. Right now, we only have one person signed up to do next Wednesday, and one person to do, I think it's March the 20th. So, if you've got one person signed up, that means you've got a team leader, right? So, all you need is helping hands. So... If some of you would consider signing up to help next week in particular, and then on March the 20th, we we would greatly appreciate it. So we make sure we have food for everybody. So uh, take your time before you go and uh, sign up. It's in Information Hall is the sign-up sheet out there where, where all information is located. <laughs> Hence the name Information Hall. Um, let's begin with prayer. Holy Michael, Archangel, defend us in the day of battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and the snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust down to hell Satan and all wicked spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. That uh, is the invocation of St. Michael, the Archangel, and I thought that was an appropriate one to be used as we begin our conversation. I want to say straight out that this is not meant to be a horror film in any way, shape, or form. I know we're talking about Satan and the evolution of evil, but I expect it to be biblical discussion and a discussion that hopefully connects us to the here and the now uh, in our lives, or maybe it won't connect us so much to the here and now, but the conversation uh, is important, I think. Um, we had a class back during the season of Advent, if you remember, on angels, and I promised that to keep in line with Dan Brown, who wrote a book called Angels and Demons, we'd have to do, we did an angels class in Advent, we should do a demons class uh, in Lent to talk about these two different forces and from whence they do come. And so this class is really not so much about demons, though they kind of come up as we go through, but more about the evolution of evil. I, I was looking back over my notes. I've taught this class like four times in the past, and it changes most every time. And the first time I attempted to put it together, the title was Satan, the personification of evil. And that I was told that was too long, so I cut personification down to evolution of evil. Still really long, but trying to go for a, a way to, to talk about it and dive into it. So, as is often the case with our kickoff day, which is today, I thought we'd just sort of investigate what we're discussing when we talk about the term Satan or the devil, and, and sort of end with a, a few points that I think are important. And then next week, we'll kick in, we'll, we'll start working into the scriptures and talking about really that term evolution of the persona. That's really what the, that's what the original title was, the evolution of the personification of evil in the Bible and in church history. I got shut down by that. I remember my, the, the uh, Christian education director of St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Jacksonville said, now it's too long, you need to cut it down. So I got rid of personification. But really, if, if, if we're talking about Satan, that, that's part of that. Um, so I figure the best way to start this off is just to throw out the questions. The questions are, who is Satan? And what is the devil? And I ask this question again from the person from the personification. From the place where we are, which is in the Episcopal Church, which is a church that is quite proudly so stays away from this topic a whole lot, which I think is, is, is a good idea to do. Even though when we come into the season of Lent, as uh, Jeannie preached so well this past Sunday, we run into the, uh, the dark side of the force, if we might call it that. 
Um, and again, I noticed that this Sunday, uh, the devil pops up in our readings as well. And honestly, if we're, as we go through this, you're going to be surprised at how often we find the devil popping up in, in the incarnation, the story of Jesus in the Bible, beyond Jesus in the Bible, and the writings of Paul, the Catholic epistles like First and Second Peter, Jude, and of course the Revelation of St. John. And we, we'll find its beginning points, as we always do, in the Old Testament. But the question for us as people of faith today, or maybe as just people who like to watch scary movies, who is Satan and what is the devil? Uh, anybody want to dive into that uh, topic real quick before I bounce ahead with some photos? Yes. Yeah, so a fallen angel is what you're saying. Well, again, if you assume that those in heaven are angelic, right? Therefore, the Satan is a fallen angel. Yeah. Yeah, so an offender against God or... Yeah. Yeah. Through his influence, people who are Yeah, exactly, exactly. Sure, sure. Good, good examples of evil. You just jumped from what Satan or what the devil is to what evil is and the interconnection of those things. But you started with talking about a fallen angel, which is the classic story, but it's going to be interesting to find where that comes in the Holy Scripture, because uh, it, it takes a while for us to get to the fallen angel, but there is a sense early on, in the church at least, maybe not in Judaism, but in the church, that Satan is uh, an angel who went bad, sort of, we might say. What else? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, I like that in the Bible, lawyers are automatically in tune with the devil. <laughs> it's just the truth of the matter. Uh, it, it, it is, as uh, Jeannie was pointing out in her sermon, and we'll definitely be talking about this, in this next week, that the term Satan comes from really what is mostly a, a verb or, a, or an adjective, ha-satan, which means the accuser. And that term comes to us as, a, as an individual character, the most in the, the book of Job, in which, yes, God, uh, Satan is present within God's heavenly uh, court, so to speak, and, and Satan has a purpose to go down and be the accuser. He's the prosecuting attorney that God sends out to do God's work, which fits quite well with the idea of, of an angel because of this sense of, God being a creator of both the physical and God being the creator of the spiritual and this spiritual realm having a place in it in which these angelic forms are in place and, and Satan plays that role. Or again, Ha-Satan. It's not really a name in the Old Testament. It's a description of, of who he is. His title will be in the book of Job, The Accuser, is really what that comes down to. What else? Yes? Right. Heaven and Hell in, in Milton's Paradise Lost yeah. Are you going to talk about where he got that idea? Yeah, yeah, exactly. A big spiritual, puritanical... Um, yeah. John Milton um, has his... Well, not necessarily theologian, but he was like... Really close. He's pretty close. He's a yeah, great he writer, like, and, and, and his writings will have nearly as much influence on our modern views of Satan and the devil as the Bible will, because he will take uh, that story and put it into writing in a way that that embellishes the scripture in a lot of ways. There was one other writer, though, who nearly gives us a deeper definition of, of what heaven and hell is as well. And who was that? Dante. Yeah, exactly. Dante will be another, earlier than Milton, uh, who will, be an, an, will give us a, a deeper description of the inferno uh, and uh, purgatory and, and paradiso, which, of course, is heaven. Anybody else want to? Yes, Jim Lee. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I'm thinking we kind of personify evil. We 
Yeah, well, and it's arguable that there is a personification within the Genesis story as well. We'll talk about this next week. And that personification is what in the Genesis creation narrative story? The serpent. The serpent, though, will later be, and John Milton will give you a good hand at describing the serpent, but the serpent will be described in the revelation of John as, as the devil. And there'll be the connection, even though in the Jewish text, we have no title or, or any explanation of what that is except a serpent. But if it's, if it's tempting, I mean, everything about the serpent fits the development of the understanding of evil all the way down to the big crime that's committed, which is going against the wishes of God, going for something personal over what God has laid out. So, a very important part of the whole. The fiend, yeah. It's a good and evil text, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're gonna, and as we go through this class, we're gonna move through these, these developments: the Old Testament next week, New Testament, the Middle Ages, which of course has a really important piece in understanding from Christians what evil and Satan and all that stuff is all about, uh, especially under Thomas Aquinas, up to the now, in which we live in a much more secular place, in which this idea of the devil runs all over the place. Uh, sometimes not in the church, though. Interestingly enough, it's everywhere else. It's not in the church, but you know, um, there's a there's a there's a thing called good news, and I would say there's plenty of good news that includes the devil in the scripture. But it's generally that we have great hope and and, and help and and less worries about that. But we'll talk about that as time goes on. Let me run through some images because I want to get to what the devil has played out to be across time and history. So this is the, the classic. I took this picture myself in York, England a long time ago in a section of town in York that I can't remember the name of. Anybody, anybody been to York before enough to know it well? Yes. There's a little place there, Belinda, in which it's a, it, it dates back to the medieval period. It's got a title. It's a street. The Shambles. There we go. Melinda's from England, of course she knows this stuff. But uh, yes, the shambles. This photo is on one of the shops in the, in the shambles. And it may not date back to the Middle Ages, but it sure looks good. And it includes all the, the personification we think of when we think about the devil, right? Not necessarily something that comes from the Bible, though, right? Um, what do we think of when we think of the classic picture of, of the cartoon devil from our childhood? Horns. Horns, hooves, fork tail. Anybody know where that those images actually come from? The great god Pan. The great god Pan has a whole lot to do with that, which comes out of Greek. I mean, it would have been actually earlier than Christianity, but it'll it'll have a lot to do with 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 the way Christianity was really good about taking things and and reimagining them in the sense of our faith. Um, always important though is the nice chain, right? which is a good indication that the devil is chained uh, and, and he's kept away from this section of the shambles. And um, anyway, I just took that picture a long time ago. Thought I'd share it. What? You thought it was a belt? It could be a good belt, you know, a good chain belt. I don't know. Here's a, a picture with a different name, Lucifer. Another name that does come from the Bible. Uh, what does Lucifer mean? Anybody... Light. Bearer of light, the light bearer, right? Which is interesting because light is very important in, in the story of Jesus. We just talked about when we were in the today service, right? The, the story is a service of light. We began with that prayer. Um, but there is, interestingly enough, a sense of a light bearer. But again, that goes all the way back to that idea of a fallen angel, right? Where does this picture come from? Anybody want to take a guess? We've already mentioned the name. Yeah, let's pretend like this is ice right here. So this is Dante, because that's the amazing story of the Inferno, right? When, um, oh, I've forgotten the name, the character who's walking through. Um, what? Virgil leads them through, right? Uh, whoever the character is that's on the tour, right? When he gets to the bottom, 
Satan is not engulfed in flame, which I grew up in churches where there's a whole lot of flame and brimstone coming out of hell. But in Dante's image, it's ice. He's frozen, and he has uh, three terrible sinners that he's three heads are having their mouths, right? One of them is... Um, Julius. Is it? Julius Caesar, Cassius, and Judas. Yeah, and Judas, of course, is there. Right. Mona, you know you're Dante. We're going to ask you about the Inferno. I don't know where I got this picture. I can't remember, but I was going for an image that sort of gives us a sense of, of ice. And, and interestingly enough, I mean, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, let's go back our, our sense of hell being a place of fire and brimstone, right? But when we talk about the Holy Spirit, what do we see descending upon the apostles? Tongues that are like flames. In the early church, flame and, and light was very much tied to angelic forces, which is why when Dante makes it down into the inferno, he gets out of the inferno. When he gets to, to Lucifer, to the devil, he finds the devil's not in fire. He's locked in this terrible ice that has uh, frozen up all of everything. The devil is, is caught in. So uh, there's, a, there's an image. Another image, is this the devil? Tricky. We're moving into passing the Renaissance and the devil's looking buff. I, you know, that's the picture I meant to do. I meant to put the classic, well, this will be coming up soon, the Alabama, you know, go to church or the devil will get you. Why does the devil have to have six-pack abs in that, in that sign? I drove by and saw it for real on the way back from Montgomery from convention. And if there hadn't been a, a gigantic semi-truck flying behind me, I would have pulled over just so I could get a picture. But I missed it. But I, I'm like, but this, this image of, of Satan is what begins to develop uh, in, the 18, in the 19th century predominantly. And I, I forgot when this, this was created. Um, but I think it was in the 19th century. So you begin to see a sense of the light bearer, uh, of the idea of Lucifer from that period. And what do we see here? We see a crown, right? I mean, an image of, uh, that, uh, that's broken, a scepter that's been broken, another sense of, of going back to the fallen angel. There's the scepter on the bottom. What's that? It's the apple which connects this character to, to uh, the Genesis story, right? And we have something that looks angelic, right? Very good looking guy there. But the, the wings are no longer feathered wings, right? They're, we moved into the back territory. Yes, Alexander. Wasn't he described as greatest of angels prior to his fall? Well, he is, but not so much in the Bible. But it'll become part of the story. And we're going to talk about next week, the, um, and, and the folks in my Bible study who heard me talk about this so much, they're ready to dive into it. But the, the first book of Enoch, which will be read in the Hellenistic period by Jews and will become a high influencer on Satan. Again, if you look in the Old Testament, you don't find any of this. But if you read First Enoch, which is being written at the same time, and you find, we just had a reference in First Peter this past Sunday. One of our readings mentioned those that were cast down that was a reference to First Enoch in the New Testament, interestingly enough. So we'll talk about that and the influence of, of um, an external Jewish writing on the idea of Satan in the Bible and later on. Yes? Do you know who the sculptor is? No, if I've been, I told you, I've, I've got to go back and look it up. But I, I, held, I looked up a lot of things for this, but I forgot to look that one up. But I'm pretty sure it's a 19th century. I'll try to look it up and have it next week. The hairstyle's looking good. Again, he's very buff there, isn't he? So. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Guillaume G. G. E. F. S. G. E. F. No, G. E. E. F. S. G. E. E. F. S. Guillaume I'm just making French. I don't know what What do you have a, ta a text or a time? Ah, 19th century, I got it. 1848. So, there we go. This is 1887 from Rome. Another image of Lucifer, oh, Lucifer the light bearer. The 19th century has a whole lot of, of, of revolution in it. And, and again, the church 
is struggling, especially in Europe, and there begins movements that begin to see the light bearer as someone worth looking back into. And this is one of those images that comes from the 19th century of the Satan, again, looking buff. He's always looking buff. But he's got his, he's, he's not got a, um, a halo, right? But he does have this sort of image of light. And again, they, he doesn't have the, the wings that you get used to seeing, the, the bat wings, but he's got dark wings and he's got a, a light in his hand. And this will become, again, very important. This is a famous, uh, well, I don't know how famous it is, but if I go to tour in Italy, I'm going to go look at it. But again, another piece, I think this was created in 1889. It was meant to be a memorial for workers who worked on a tunnel at, around that period. It's at the um, Piazzo Statuto. I, that's my Italian, so I apologize. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to show you a picture of this one in a couple of weeks, the whole thing. But interestingly enough, this is supposed to be genius. And the idea of the, of the architect will be this is intelligence moving against just brawn force. And underneath it is a whole slew of rocks with a bunch of men who look like they're trying to get up on it, but uh, above it, onto it. Um, and it has the name of, of those who designed the tunnel that uh, was, was put together and that the memorial, memorial was made to. But many people have pointed out that, again, in the 19th century in Europe, there was lots of discussions about Lucifer and this character here certainly fits more with that interesting bill uh, of the angel, the light bearer. And again, why would it be Lucifer and not just an angel? Well, when you see the full image, you'll see that the guys underneath it look like they're struggling. And this character tends to be holding them down. This star, interestingly enough, has disappeared and is no longer there anymore if you go. Um, nobody knows what happened to it, but again... This is where 19th century, 20th century comes together, and people may be just implying too much. The architect would say no, but I think it fits well with that 19th century image of Lucifer. Is this the devil? <laughs> <laughs> Movies. I mean, where's the other way that we put Satan into view? It's in film, right? And uh, this is Jack Nicholson from the movie uh, uh, the Witches of Eastwick, 1987. I'm sure the Silver Saints will be playing all these movies next. Uh, the Witches of Eastwick, which is a great movie, and it's Jack Nicholson's one of his several times to play the devil in it. And he's quite an, an impish devil in this one. Um, of course, these are two images. This movie, uh, this is, uh, of course, Robert De Niro, right? Robert De Niro and... Um, Al Pacino, thank you. I wanted to put Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, and Jack Nicholson together because they're those great actors of that period. This is from the movie Angel Heart, which has was at the same time as Witches of Eastwick, 1987. Another movie for the uh, Silver Saints movie day. So it's a little tricky there. But the thing, only way you can tell that uh, um, Robert De Niro is, is the devil is he has these really pointy fingernails. You just barely see them here. But this happens in Louisiana, and he's a very uh, Louisiana version of the devil. Uh, and then, of course, this is from the devil's advocate, yet again, the devil being a lawyer, as it is generally the case. And uh, this movie came out in 1997, and um, had Keanu Reeves in it, right? Remember Keanu Reeves? And it was... Uh, Al Pacino's time to play the devil. As we move through movies, another movie for this movie came out in 1988. It was quite controversial in 1988. Anybody want to guess the name of it? The Last Temptation. The Last Temptation of Christ is exactly it. And it, it has uh, a, a, an image of the devil that, again, takes on a different personification. This is the devil in The Last Temptation of Christ. She appears as an angelic form. I mean, if you know anything about the movie, the whole movie was controversial because it is this story about Jesus coming off the cross, choosing not to die on the cross. He is tempted by the devil, even though this version of Jesus with Willem Dafoe doesn't quite recognize the devil. I mean, that kind of, you think Jesus would, but it is this beautiful little girl character in it who turns into a burst of flame at the very end, which gives away her identity at that point. But um, another rather androgynous version of the devil, though definitely feminine, 
is this character of the devil in the movies. Anybody want to guess this one? Passion. The Passion of the Christ, I heard somebody say. Right? It's the Passion of the Christ. Um, the Mel Gibson movie. Uh, another image uh, that's quite frightening to see this woman moving around. I picked out one more image from The Last Temptation of Christ, which is the scene where the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leadership, are moving in, uh, and Jesus, I believe, is being scourged at this point. And you get this scene in which the devil suddenly appears moving in the background, which sort of gives you that sense of, of the devil. It's very... Uh, medieval idea of, of the devil and Jesus in battle, right? And the devil thinks that the devil is winning only to discover that the devil has, has not won at the end. But this version of the devil is there and it's creepy and very Grim Reaper-esque, I think. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. The symbolic image of that in this particular... Because, again, we're going to do the Stations of the Cross on Friday. The Passion of the Christ is Mel Gibson's version of the Stations of the Cross. And the seventh station, or is it the eighth station? I get them confused. Is Jesus encounters the women of, of Jerusalem. And that is where that scene happens. The women of Jerusalem are there and Jesus says, Don't weep for me, weep for your your children and your children's children. And this character is there looking like she's one of the women holding a baby. But when the baby turns around, you realize it's an adult. Uh, in a, it's a very spooky, scary version. So that's where that scene comes in, is this sense of Jesus meets the women of Jerusalem, which is uh, the seventh station of the cross. Um, again, yeah, if you watch The Passion and you know the stations, Mel Gibson hits each one of them, all 14 of them to the end. Um, with his version of those. Um, this is a very modern one. Anybody watched the series Sandman on Netflix? No. I did. And, uh, <laughs> and Sandman is, uh, um, oh, what's his name? Neil Gaiman. Neil Gaiman, yes. Who's written all kinds of great books and Netflix put it together. Um, this woman is Gwendolyn, I can't think of her name. She was in Game of Thrones, if you watch Game of Thrones. Um, and she plays Lucifer, what's the last name? Oh, oh, Lucifer Daystar, that's the character. Um, Neil Gaiman, this was a set of, uh, um, not comic books, what do you, it's uh, graphic novels. Don't just call them comic books, they're graphic novels. And in the graphic novel, Lucifer Daystar is in it, and this is just from a couple of years ago. More classic in of the devil. Um, I think, again, they choose this particular woman because she sort of borderlines on the androgynous a bit when they dress her up in, in this particular costume. But that's the role she plays. I believe in Neil Gaiman's uh, graphic novel, I think, again, it's a rather androgynous but more male version of Lucifer Daystar. But anyway, just another example of, of the images of, of Satan as we move through modern times. I, I wanted to bring this up because this is going to lead us into our, our final little bit of discussion for tonight. And that is the difference in the way we see angels and the difference in the way we see demons. Um, I looked this up. Don't ask me where it came from. I'm going to say Gallup. It's a Gallup poll. Um, number of Americans who say they believe in angels today. Now this does not say Christians. It doesn't say I, you know, it doesn't say Native Americans or Mormons. It just says number of Americans in general, right, that believe in angels today. Anybody want to make a guess at the percentage of Americans who believe in angels today? How much? How much? 7 in 10, 69% of Americans believe in angels. I mean, which is a fairly high number in the 21st century. If you look back even 20 years, it probably was higher than that. Um, but when you look at the number of Americans who say they believe in demons today, it's quite a bit lower, 2 in 5 or 43%. Now, I'm not here to argue about which one you should believe in. I, I think it's interesting, though, uh, that angels are, are very... I mean, we talked about this in my angel class, right? We tend to see angels, even though the Bible has different definitions of them, 
as being what? Good. Good. Well, good's right. But we also tend to see them as loved ones gone on, you know. Um, we think of, what, you know, what, what's the main definer of angels in, in our modern times? It's the, the movie we watch at Christmas. Or I didn't. I watched uh, the Christmas story with uh, Red Rider BB guns. But it's. Uh, but what's the other movie that? That's a Wonderful Life, right? And every time, a, every time a what is it? Every time a bell rings, an angel gets their wings, right? So, and I think again, good angels are good. Angels give us a sense of of the positive beyond death. But I would argue that angels also represent for us as Christians the idea that if God creates a physical world, God creates a spiritual world. If God creates a physical world and there can be things that turn against God in the physical world, which we constantly deal with on a regular basis, and we'll talk about this class in regards to what we refer to as evil, then the sense that God would create something on the spiritual world that would have some sort of fallen or, or way of turning against God in the spiritual realm is what creates the difference in angels and demons. I thought it would be interesting to show you. I just This is a Gallup poll because I saw it. It said Gallup poll on for 2023. And this was really pointing out the, the fall from how high it was in the year 2000 to the year of 2023. I won't get into that discussion. You can look that up. But the number of Americans who believe in God today is still relatively high, probably compared to... Europe, Europe and, and other Western countries, it's 74%. And interestingly enough, I thought this would be a lot lower. The number of Americans who say they believe in the devil today is 58%. So still, uh, I would say if we were to take out Americans and put in the term Episcopalians, that'd be a lot lower probably yeah. than 58 percentile. But the question I want to talk about as we go through this is, is how do we make sense of that? Is it important to talk about that? Where does, where does the sense of devil emerge from? Uh, where do we get it from in the Bible? And, um, and beyond that, a, a couple of photos before I get to the final question. And I'm not going to have an answer for the final question. I, just, I think that's ultimately my goal for this class. But this is from Coventry Cathedral in England. Uh, um, this is probably, I'm guessing, is a 20th century. Uh, it must be 20th century because Coventry cathedral was pretty much destroyed during World War II. But it's another classic image of the prayer we began with, which, which was the invocation of St. Michael, the archangel, doing battle with the devil. And uh, this devil looks a lot more like our common image of the devil. He's still a little buff. I don't get that. But St. Michael is too. I mean, St. Michael's got a, a pretty good six-pack right there too. And he's beat the devil down there, standing on the devil's head, right? And I'm going to bring this picture up just to, as a quick reminder of probably the, the moment in the year 1974, and again, I turned 50 this year, so the 50th anniversary of this movie just came about, and this is probably the greatest bringer back of the devil to the 20th century of the last uh, situation. So I'll move on quickly because I didn't realize we'd have any younger people in here, but we won't stick with that, nor will we talk about it. But... One day I shall preach a sermon in which I'll tell you why that movie had a lot to do with why I'm a priest today and why I'm teaching you this class. Right now. Um, but, but all of this comes down to one question. And I'm just throwing this out here because this is the ultimate discussion to have as we go through the next five weeks. And that is, does Satan or the devil matter today? And I think as a church, particularly, if we were Roman Catholics, we'd have a solid answer for if we were Baptists, we'd have a solid answer for that. As Episcopalians, I have a pretty solid answer for that. But we have room for other discussions to be had. And this class, again, is not meant to uh, compel you to dive deeply into these things, but simply to understand where they come from a little bit more than I think our tradition provides you with often. I think our tradition does right in focusing on the incarnation of Jesus, and again, as Christians, our hope that comes from Jesus. we got a lot more serious things to discuss as Christians today. And we talk about it. We talked about that when we were reading First Thessalonians this morning, which is controlling our bodies and dealing with death and dying. To me, Christianity is prepared to give you hope in those issues and to give you exercises to help you overcome them. This issue of evil, though, is something that 
seems to be, I believe, still part of our world. And whether or not you want to give a personification to it or not, there's things that are going on still to this day, perhaps more so than ever before, um, with the 20th century being one of the most violent uh, uh, centuries of all time. Um, why is that? Where are the questions that we have to ask um, as Christians today? How do we deal with them? I think, again, how you deal with them is, is how you deal with them, but as a priest, you should be well prepared for it. So the point of this class is to help you with that. And I want to end with two pieces, and then I'll see if anybody has any questions if we have time. One of those comes from the very first part of our prayer book that we engage in as Christians uh, in our life, in the Book of Common Prayer, and it is from the, the baptism, holy baptism in, in the current prayer book. It's three questions. I love to talk to parents who come in for their run-through of, of getting their child baptized, the very first thing you have to do is three renunciations. And these three renunciations are, are the way the church has baptized its members from the very beginning. You used to have to turn to the West and spit in the face of, of Satan when you said this. We don't do that anymore. You should not spit in the church. Somebody's got to clean it up. <laughs> so please don't spit in the church. But there would have been a time when you would have done that and we still, as Episcopalians today in the 1979 prayer book, hold on to that. Three renunciations followed by the parents giving three affirmations, right? And the children will take this upon themselves and they go through confirmation. But the first step toward being baptized as a Christian are these three renunciations that give us a sense of what probably our church would use as defined definition of evil. First one is, do you renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? Jeannie, what did you say in your sermon about the devil and, and the wilderness and the separation from God, right? You had it really good in your sermon. Sorry, but that's what you were talking about. Sin was being separated and, and kept away from God. It was excellent. Yeah. And so, good. There's the sin we're engaged in, and then there's uh, there's the level underneath it in which evil trickles out through the world, and then there's a foundation. And the foundation of the classic ancient Christian church is Satan and all the spiritual forces, spiritual are beyond the physical, that are rebelling against God. The second one is do you renounce the evil powers of what? This world. So we move from the spiritual into this world and how this world and its powers are corrupt and can destroy the creatures of God. Do you renounce them? I renounce them. Then you get to the personal. Do you renounce all sinful desires that draw you from the love of God? So this method of renunciation is built from the bottom up, right? The spiritual, the worldly, and the personal. And parents make these renunciations and then they turn and they accept Jesus as their Savior, just like all of us Baptists did when I was in the church back then, even though we've added it into three affirmations about uh, coming into the church. And then once that's done, we're able to move into the Apostles' Creed, into the, the baptism rite. But these were originally the starting point. Do you renounce these? And then you turn to the East and you make your affirmations and you, you move into the, the rite of baptism. So I just want to throw that out there because I think it's a really good definition. It includes all these things we're talking about and what we will be talking about. We might come back to that, back to the end. And the last thing I'll leave you with before I stop talking see if you have any questions is one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite books by one of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, The Screwtape Letters, and his opening prologue, in which he says, I think brilliantly about this, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves, meaning the demons, are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. And I love how C.S. Lewis lays that out in his 1940s version of British English but it still translates so well to us today. That to be a materialist or to be a magician is really handy for those who are engaged on the spiritual level of this 
battle with God. And so the screw tape letters are all about that. They're not a horror movie like The Exorcist or some other film. They're more about the truth, which is temptation and what temptation leads us into and how temptation continues to fall on the best of us and how the church has tried to understand that. And so that's the goal of this next four weeks now, which is to walk through this and see where we end up at the end of, of our time. So get ready. Oh, yeah. And this is an important icon I hope to come back to because to me I think this from the ancient church is probably one of the best defining uh, and ancient images of, of demonic and, and Satan. And it, it is a bunch of little gnat demons running around. You know how gnats are. Gnats don't bother you. You can kill gnats easily. But if you walk into a swarm of them on the edge of a cliff, you could be in trouble, right? So we'll return to that at the end of the class. And I just thought I'd give it away. And you might as well get used to this because it's just fine. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> you have, yes, Charlie. Uh, I'm dressed now as the Lucifer connotation with Prince of Darkness. Let's say that one more time. How what? Lucifer. Yeah, is the light bearer. And Prince of Darkness. Is the Prince of Darkness, right? I mean, it, it is a difficult... I think what we'll see when we get into discussing where a light bearer comes from. Because Jesus is going to say, I saw Satan fall from heaven. And it's going to tie into the idea that Mona might have, somebody brought up about Satan or, the, or Lucifer being a primary angel at the beginning. He was the highest angel. The highest angel. Again, in, in Dante and, and Milton's version, but not in the Bible. None of that is biblical per se. But that's, that's the deal, is that that light bearer piece becomes the prince of darkness until which they're both in the same, even though they don't fit once the light bearer gives up his life and becomes the prince of darkness. He gave up his life because he wanted to be God. Yeah, he wanted to be more than what he was. I'm just the number one. In a couple of weeks, actually, no, next week, I'll, I'll have an image that comes, I think, from one of the Orthodox churches that... that has a description of that based on the readings from Ezekiel and Isaiah, which we'll talk about, in which light bearer comes up from the Old Testament. Yeah, even though that what we'll talk about next week is is the prophet Ezekiel and the prophet Isaiah talking about an angel or talking about a king? The argument would be made that they're talking about a king in the Old Testament, but when Jesus says it, he quotes Ezekiel and refers to Satan. So it's a sign of 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 the way. Jesus himself read the Old Testament in a different way than perhaps the Old Testament writers intended. Or maybe they intended that. It's just what it came out as seemed to translate one way or the other. You about to say something, Gene? Only because I've been thinking about the word personification. Yeah. And to me, personification implies that you give human traits to inanimate objects. Yes, yeah. I'm much more likely to say I believe the devil is Personification of evil yeah. than I am to state unequivocally that Satan equals evil. So the way we talk about it, if Satan is A B, the personification yeah. doesn't fit. And I think that's important because of the struggle that I saw even growing up in the rural South, which was a dualism approach, which is that Satan is somehow in battle with God on an equal level. Which again, I don't think anybody, if I ever put them on the spot, even in the church I grew up in, would ever say that's right. But sometimes the fear of Satan is so high, it creates a dualism of good versus evil. And it takes that, which I think is more of a personification perhaps, and turns it into something more than it should be. But the, the issue of angels and demons is a different discussion to be had. Because if you believe in one, if 69% believe in one and 43 only in the other, it doesn't, it doesn't match up from a Christian perspective and it's worth a deeper discussion. And then, of course, you bring in the idea of a, of a chief angel who's cast down. And the most important part of that will come in two weeks when we get to the New Testament and we talk about John's revelation. John will talk about Michael and, and Satan coming into battle. The, the image of fallen angel, if it is in the Bible, comes from the book of Revelation. 
But that's problematic because when is Revelation, is it talking about the beginning of time or the end of time? It's generally talking about the end of time. So even though the story seems to be there, it doesn't match up with apocalyptic writing as it should be. But again, it's a good sign of the church struggling hard to use their human brains to put something on the paper and have an explanation for it. And again, I don't necessarily think that means they're not correct about it or that they're completely off on their, on their pointing. It just means that it's worth our digging into ourselves if we ever want to talk about it or deal with it or read Dante again and see what we think. Or watch Neil Gaiman's Sandman and uh, see what you think about that. Any any other questions? The flame has gone off. Yes. Um, I have seen the new recently. Oh, Nephilim. That's a wonderful. Dis- but that's a whole other class. <laughs> the Nephilim comes from chapter six or chapter eight of. Uh, but Nephilim ties into First Enoch, and First Enoch is what gives us more of a definition of the devil for Christians as we are really aware of. Because it's the, that weird story of the Nephilim coming down and, and getting to know humans, women, that leads to a story about angels being cast down and put in chains, in which First Peter referenced this past Sunday. And again, in First Peter references it, and it's not in the Old Testament. Where did they get it from? Well, it comes from this book of First Enoch. I will say that there is one Christian church that does have that book in its Bible, and that's the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And because they have it in their Ethiopian language is the only way we have it in our own language because they held on to it when it disappeared in history. But again, it's just an interesting text to read because it tells us more about all that John Milton and all of that devil and angels being cast down than we ever really knew. Uh, about and it tells us that Jesus Himself read it and been talking in my Bible study about doing a Bible study on the the letter of Jude, which is the shortest text really in the whole Bible. But within it is a whole lot of really interesting, strange stuff that comes from other pieces of text that we don't even have in existence anymore. But it shows the early church read those and read them pretty seriously. I recently seen Yeah. I did my I did a theology on tap class or group once, and the, I still got it in my office. You come by, it's a little bottle, and it says uh, it "stump the priest" is what it says. <laughs> and I asked people to for that that theology on tap, that pub theology, go around and put their questions in and see if they could stump the priest. And the first one was about tell me about the Nephilim from Genesis, and man, they stumped me. But not anymore. I know all about them now. I'm prepared. <laughs> Don't think you can stump me with Nephilim if you want. And for those of you who have no idea what we're talking about, just Google it and you'll get all kinds oh, of Oh, read Genesis. Or, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Not before the 33rd chapter, I know. It's totally, it's in the first 10. Kids, they didn't have to read. Chapter 33 was a little racy, so. <laughs> yeah. That. yeah, there's there's a lot of raciness in there, so. Speaking of raciness, there's a racy carbon. Um, oh. Next week, we will get into Hasetan, the accuser in the Hebrew Bible, which will be an int- which will have some of references to uh, these strange texts that early Jews. I remember what I said. I think and you put me on the spot about about your sermon. Yeah. Didn't I say that the temptations were not put there by God? They were only put there by us. Yeah. We create our own temptation and not God. That's right. He doesn't right. bring us to the test. We constantly bring ourselves. to yeah, yeah. And the only thing Thomas Aquinas would say to that is, and some demons do oh, it too. <laughs> no, he wouldn't disagree. He'd say you're right, but he'd say temptations also come from these little things that are in place to tempt us. And you always wonder that, you know. I always, I always wonder why a child wants to stick their finger in a, in a uh, light socket. Why would an infant be interested in that when they have every toy in the world and to me, I've always said proof that the devil is real. You have children. And you have everything they want, and yet they want to climb up a ladder and fall off of it. Is the devil real? But anyway, so any other questions? 
If not, um, somebody help out with food next week so you have uh, food to eat. And I'll see you next week, next Wednesday. Thank you.